Buy less, buy better. Is frugality on the rise? In the UK, inflation is at a 40 year high and the cost of living crisis is starting to bite around the world. It's no wonder that frugality, budgeting and financial literacy are being talked about more and more on the internet. Worldwide stagflation may have accelerated this interest, but ever since millennials realized they could be languishing in a nine to five job they hated, without the prospect of home ownership and retirement ages creeping even higher, they started talking about taking things into their own hands. Cue the fire movement, tiny house movement, van life movement, among others. They started to talk about side hustles and passive income and multiple income streams. These movements and conversations may have different motivations, but what they have in common is a rejection of the status quo, a desire to do things differently. Frugality is a common thread that runs through many of these overlapping lifestyles and movements, and it's what I want to talk about today. I have also been experimenting with frugal living, specifically as a way of reducing my impact. Of course, some people live frugal lifestyles without thinking about the environment, but there does seem to be an intersection where frugality and sustainability meet. And this is something I will cover in the video. The main questions I want to explore are, what does it mean to be frugal? What do we associate with frugality? Can anyone be frugal? Does being frugal even help the environment at all? First of all, what does frugal even mean? Frugal or frugality is characterized by or reflecting economy in the use of resources. Most conversations about frugality focus on money, but the definition is broader than that. It's not just a economical use of money, but resources in general. I would suggest that money and time are the big two, but we might also consider other resources such as energy, water, cognitive bandwidth, and any others that we may deem valuable. The essence of frugality is to avoid wasting resources, usually in order to meet a long-term goal. To this extent, a frugal lifestyle is both relative and subjective. Relative because resources vary widely between individuals and subjective because what would be a waste of resources for one person might bring great value to another. It's up to the individual to decide what value versus waste means for them in terms of their resources. There's also an element of self-control and delayed gratification associated with frugality, at least according to some of the research I read. Although I do think that some people would disagree with this on the grounds that they don't feel like they are having to exercise self-control in their frugal lifestyle. Okay, so this idea of not keeping up with the Joneses. The way you use your resources, especially money, always has social implications. This will be dependent on the social norms of your friends, neighbours, family and colleagues, and it can be difficult to have the self-concept to deviate from these. I think this is particularly true if you are trying to be frugal. Some people might find it difficult to say no to an expensive social occasion, or more generally, to reject the desire to keep up with the Joneses. Like it or not, people will judge us for what we do with our money. And if we are honest, we might judge others too. We can be judged if we are perceived to spend too much relative to our means or too little, especially if this extends to our treatment of others. It can be hard not to have an opinion when you hear things like Bono buying a first class pain ticket to fly a hat to Italy, or Tamara Ecclestone spending $1.5 million on a crystal bath. But we go further than merely having an opinion about the way others spend their money. We often make value judgments about a person's character based on how they use money. We lord wealthy people when they make large charitable donations. And people seem to love it when they read stories of celebrities and multimillionaires behaving just like us, whether they're wearing high street fashion or driving a beat up old car. We interpret this behavior as evidence that they are humble, perceived as a rare quality in the rich and famous. But we also demonize the rich when we believe they are not spending their money on the right things. Concluding all manner of negative things about their character, rightly or wrongly. But judgments are not limited to the rich and famous, like when Conservative MP Lee Anderson recently suggested that people who needed to use food banks just didn't know how to budget. 
in this country. We've got generation after generation who cannot cook properly, they can't cook a meal from scratch, they cannot budget, the challenge is there. Or when millionaire Tim Gurner told millennials that they couldn't afford homes because they ate too much smashed avocado on toast. But what about people who are perceived as spending little? There are loads of negative words in the English language to describe behaviour related to reduced spending, like penny pincher, miser, tightwad, cheapskate, skinflint, tightfisted, and stingy. Many of these words have connotations of lack of generosity or even greed. It's interesting that there are fewer negative words to describe people who are extravagant or wasteful with their money. Words like spendthrift or profligate. A notorious example of penny pinching was Jean-Paul Getty Sr, an oil tycoon who at one point was the richest private citizen in the world. However, when his grandson was kidnapped in 1973, he was reluctant to pay the $17 million ransom. Eventually, the kidnappers reduced the ransom amount to $3 million and he agreed to pay $2.2 million himself and he lent his son the remaining $800,000 at 4% interest. There are many other anecdotes about Getty's attitude to money, but at the heart of this example is a shocking display of warped priorities. Getty was not merely being frugal when he refused to pay the ransom. I would say that what is judged negatively is any reluctance to spend money out of greed or the desire to hoard wealth. Added to this is any sense that people are being ungenerous to others. What does seem to be acceptable is saving money and being sensible with money as long as you are not stingy towards others and your desire to save is not motivated by greed. This is where frugality comes in. It's a more socially acceptable way to be economical with money, but I do think frugality's image has shifted in the past 10 years or so in the West. Let's discuss frugality among millennials and Gen Z. After the strict rationing of the Second World War, consumer culture took off again, having had a brief wave in the 1920s before the Great Depression. The 1980s in the West are often remembered for their consumerism and materialistic culture, with the emergence of the yuppie. The culture is exemplified in Bret Easton Ellis' book American Psycho, in which most of the characters are solely focused on appearance, wealth, and conspicuous consumption. A tasteful thickness of it. Oh my god. It even has a watermark. Fast forward to the present day, and we see a partial shift amongst some millennials and Gen Z to the buy less, buy better mantra, at least when it comes to clothes. On the other hand, we also see the huge success and popularity of fast fashion powerhouse Shein. And despite their taste for Depop, Gen Z has not killed fast fashion. It's true that the global north are still huge consumers, but there are now mainstream pockets who are rowing against the tide. As mentioned in the introduction, there are several movements in which frugality forms part of the lifestyle. Fire, van life, tiny house, minimalism, zero waste, and simple living. These movements are making it not just socially acceptable to be frugal, but also trendy. As Rachel Monroe in her New Yorker article on van life notes, what began as an attempt at a simpler life quickly became a lifestyle brand. But all trends have an expiry date. After a few years of a movement or lifestyle, online content starts to pop up along the lines of why van life is dead or why I quit the fire movement or I regret becoming a minimalist. People want to be the first to ride the wave of a trend and then they want to be the first to declare its extinction. So who can actually afford to be frugal? Well, we're missing something in this discussion. We need to make the distinction between those who have enough resources but choose to be frugal and those who do not have enough resources and are forced to be frugal. I want to talk about the concept of scarcity and some ideas from a book called Scarcity, Why Having Too Little Means So Much by Senhil Malenathan and psychologist Elder Shafir. The authors discuss what they describe as tunneling as a result of scarcity. Tunneling can happen when the brain is primarily consumed with reducing scarcity. People are so focused on the bills that need to be paid today that it is extremely difficult to plan for the future. The author's research led them to conclude that poverty increases cognitive load and taxes cognitive bandwidth. They provide an interesting example in an experiment with Indian sugarcane farmers who earn most of their income at one point in the year after the harvest. 
The authors conducted cognitive tests on the farmers a couple of months before the harvest, when they had the least money, and a couple of months after, not long after they had received a lump sum. The farmers scored the equivalent of 10 IQ points higher in the tests after the harvest compared to before. As I'm not an expert in IQ, I I don't know how significant a change of 10 IQ points is, but the overall evidence in this area does seem to suggest that scarcity can negatively impact cognitive processing. So how does this increase in cognitive load disadvantage those on lower incomes? The answer may be in the second experiment the authors conducted. They enlisted a group of Princeton undergraduates and asked them to play a computer game. The game involved answering questions and for every correct answer they gave, they won money in the game. So the students were split into two groups, those that had 50 seconds to answer questions and those that only had 15. Half in each group were offered the opportunity to borrow time if they felt they needed it. However, every second borrowed reduced their overall time by two seconds. In other words, they paid interest on any time they borrowed. Unsurprisingly, the students who had 50 seconds to answer and had the opportunity to borrow time only occasionally chose to borrow. The interesting difference was in the group of 15 second students of whom only half were given the option to borrow time. Those that had the option to borrow time often did, but ended up with fewer correct answers and therefore less money than the other 15 second group who were not given the option to borrow. The researchers believe that this result could shed some light on the use of payday loans, i.e. loans of very small amounts with very high rates of interest due to be paid back when the borrower received their wages. They concluded that anyone with scarce resources would be susceptible to the cycle of debt so often seen with payday loans. This is because scarcity itself affects our ability to reason and make financial decisions based on the longer term. I would actually come back on this point to counter that whichever way you look at it, some people simply do not get paid enough to cover the most basic living costs. Someone in this position is not able to save and if an unexpected, essential and urgent expense comes up, a payday loan may be the only option. Not just the one that is chosen because of a reduced ability to plan. Conservative MP Rachel McLean, however, has some excellent advice for those on low incomes who are struggling. But over the long term, we need to have a plan to grow the economy and make sure that people are able to protect themselves better, uh, whether that is by taking on more hours or moving to a better paid job. So that's the answer for people on low incomes, everyone. Just take on more hours or move to a better paying job. It's simple, really. Lower income households also may not be less able to take advantage of the most effective frugal strategies, such as bulk buying or purchasing when items are on sale. They have less inventory at home and may not have the money to accelerate purchases to take advantage of a deal. Lower income households are also being hit the hardest by inflation. The Institute of Fiscal Studies has calculated that even though inflation is currently at 9% in the UK, for the bottom 10% of the population, this is 10.9%. The distinction that I wanted to make in this discussion is between those who do not perceive significant scarcity in their resources and are making a choice to live frugally, perhaps to meet a long-term goal such as buying a house or moving abroad, and then there are those whose resources are not enough and even if they do live frugally, the best they might hope for is to avoid debt. There is no long-term payoff or reward. But is frugality good for the environment, even if that's not your motivation? Cropfield and colleagues did not find that frugality was related to ecological impact. They reasoned that although frugal consumers were more resourceful, they bought in bulk or secondhand, but did not necessarily buy less. They also point out that frugal consumers are not necessarily anti-consumption. On the contrary, their saving behaviour can even serve materialistic ends. However, I would suggest that buying secondhand, although it counts as consuming, has a lower ecological impact than buying something new. The researchers found that those who followed a lifestyle of voluntary simplicity had the lowest ecological impact of the anti-consumption lifestyles they studied. They define voluntary simplicity as an inner desire to live a good life by reducing materialism. Voluntary simplicity is also strongly correlated with social and environmental issues. Uh, but I feel like this study ignores a high level of overlap between voluntary simplicity and frugality. 
Those who live a simple life are also likely to be frugal. On the other hand, Gattisby Burnett et al. found that frugality was a strong predictor of pro-environmental behaviours, and several other studies have found a positive relationship between frugality and pro-environmentalism. I'd love to know your thoughts in the comments about this discussion and whether you consider yourself to be frugal. How does this interrelate with a sustainable lifestyle for you, if at all? If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up and consider subscribing. And if you want to see more content, then check me out on Patreon. Thank you so much for watching. I'll see you next time.